welcome to the new JFK show number 97, where we're going to tie up some loose ends concerning the Sitka attack on Dr. Fetzer. It's been nothing but a merciless TKO from one end to the other. Then we're going to turn it over to Larry Rivera with some new research as usual. But um, right now, we've, at the uh, Oswald Innocence Campaign website, there's a, quite a few new um, people that's been inducted to the OIC or been joining the OIC. So, Larry, go ahead and give us an update on that, and we're going to turn it over to Dr. Fetzer and tie up some loose ends. Thank you, Gary. Uh, well, you know, I'm happy to announce that we've got some three uh, very outstanding uh, people uh, joining the OIC, starting, uh, of course, with the uh, uh, Michael Parenti, uh, who's written 24 books, uh, more than 500 articles, PhD from Yale. Uh, his article from 1996, The Gangster State, is still relevant today, and it uh, deals with uh, the, J the JFK assassination and all of the uh, problems that uh, those who, uh, who uh, still think that the Oswald acted alone. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, Professor David Caban, from uh, Tampa, Florida, who's also a professor and who's done a lot of research and uh, a lot of uh, 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 education on the JFK assassination, and uh, Richard Shaddock, uh, who uh, an ex-Marine uh, computer consultant, uh, U.S. military, and NSA computer uh, skills specialist, who's uh, uh, done a lot of uh, work with the Pentagon and uh, staffers there, and who uh, who's uh, run a couple of websites, AJKAT.org and JFKTruth.org, and I just wanted to uh, make the public aware of uh, these three additions to, to the OIC, and I'll just turn it over to Jim, to Jim uh, right now so we can get started. Well, that's great, Larry. Those are terrific ads. Everyone should visit the homepage of the Oswald Innocence Campaign where they can see how many outstanding scholars and students of JFK subscribe to the proposition of Lee Oswald's innocence of the assassination of JFK insofar as he was on the front doorway of the book depository observing the motorcade as it took place, which means that he could not only not have been the lone demanded gunman, but he could not possibly have even been one of the shooters. So today we're going to do a few odds and ends left over. You see here the introduction that I have been using for each of our responses to G. Eugenio. If we move forward to, this is just about part one, but of course we've covered part one and part two in a seven-part series. So this is uh, number eight as an add-on. And where in particular, in the second paragraph, he, he talks about uh, uh Chauncey Holt, having reported in a radio interview that he was a counterfeiter who worked for the CIA in 1963, that he was ordered to bring actually 15 sets of false Secret Service uh, identification at Dealey Plaza, that he disguised himself as one of the three tramps in the famous photographs of the so-called hobos, who after being unloaded from a train car, were escorted through Dealey Plaza on the way to police headquarters. But he made a remark in passing, Larry, of particular interest about the idea that Ch Chauncey should have been in New Orleans with Lee Oswald, and yet we have photographic proof that that was indeed the case. Would you like to talk about this photograph? Yeah, yeah yes, indeed. Uh, this is a classic. This is a, a screen capture from a video of Lee Oswald passing out leaflets there in front of the, uh, the trademark there in, in New Orleans. And uh, to the right is uh, Chauncey Holt. And uh, we're going to look at a couple more slides. Uh, to the left, we see uh, the uh, famous uh, Asian man, you know, uh, uh, with the uh, akimbo uh, pose there with both hands uh, at, at, uh, at his shoulders. Okay. And uh, Lee Oswald, you know, in his uh, necktie and everything, you know, passing out leaflets, uh, uh, very uh, visible there, you know, downtown, and uh, very happy for the, fair, for the Fair Play for Cuba committee. That's right, for the Fair Play for Cuba committee there. And uh, as we know, uh, later on, you know, he had uh, that uh, big fracas and altercation with Carlos Bringier and his uh, friends there, where they uh, ended up uh, being arrested and taken uh, in uh, to the New Orleans uh, Police Department and booked. 
And then it was it remarkable on. that the fracas only lasted a, a minute and a half or so. They got it on TV. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. Uh, that's that's what really uh, is so remarkable about these uh, encounters here with uh, Lee Oswald being sheep dipped, as Jim Garrison uh, so eloquently uh, uh, stated uh, in New Orleans. You know, uh, creating this uh, legend of being a, a communist. Uh, you know, pro Castro, uh, where in reality he was quite the opposite. Chance, uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, we, we, this uh, next slide. Uh, this man here, and uh, who is passing right in front of the camera. If uh, we've done uh, some uh, extensive analysis here, and and the, the face has been obscured. Okay. And uh, there's a couple of more uh, uh, images that we're going to show here. But uh, basically, this man looks remarkably similar to uh, Michael Payne. Uh, Mike, Michael Payne, exactly. And uh, and we've uh, inserted uh, a, a an image, you know, for comparison. And uh, we're gonna, you know, look at the, the next couple of slides where, uh, you know, it, 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 if uh, you know, if there was a problem, you know, with this image or with this film, then why obscure the face of the man? Okay, it's very obvious if you look closely at the eyes and the face that uh, some kind of, of uh, uh, mechanism here has been uh, uh, put in here to obscure his face, you know, some kind of ink or, or uh, you know. The fellow has an unusually shaped skull, as did Michael Payne. Yeah. The, the eyebrows and all that, it looks to me as though that is indeed who this party is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I the first uh, when I first started uh, looking at this, yeah. And then here, uh, he's got like these little squiggly uh, 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 lines coming down his face, you know, where it seems like it's been airbrushed, you know. And then we did uh, more comparisons uh, with uh, more uh, other images of Michael Payne, and uh, and it seems like uh, you know it's him. You know, I'm not gonna go out on a limb here and say that you know absolutely 100 percent that it's him, but you know, why would the uh, face be obscured? Is you know, is my point here? You know, so. Oh, I think it's a, I think it's a very good bet. I'd say it's uh, ninety to ten at least that this is Michael Payne, probably actually higher. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And and of course, if John C. Holt himself uh, identified himself in this uh, footage here on the right there, uh, Jim. Yes, 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 and of course. And don't forget, this this was the days when to get someone on television, you had to take out these cameras that weighed hundreds of pounds. It wasn't like today where you could just have it in the palm of your hand. That's right. That's right. It was a big I, I, deal I, to get someone on television. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, these were huge. Uh, this was there were huge uh, pieces of equipment that had to be mobilized in order to, you know, get this down like this. There we go. I was having trouble with my my advance here, so but there we have it. The point is here I'm going to talk briefly about the number of times JFK was hit because it seemed as though D. Eugenio didn't understand what we know about it, which include, of course, being hit in the back from uh, in the front from uh, from uh, the, the down the triple underpass. Actually, the second hit, the first hit coming from in the back from the county records building. And then after the limousine is brought to a halt, he's hit in the back of the head from the Dow Tech, slumps forward, Jackie ease him back up, looking him right in the face when he's hit in the right temple from the right front uh, by that frangible or exploding bullet that blows his brains out the back of his head. And while we know a lot about all of these, I mean, it's, you know, I've gone through this before, but I want to do a brief review just to confirm for the show Shot in the back, five, the hole in the jacket, five and a half inches below the collar at, at a downward angle. There's a shirt. Uh, David Manning actually had a member of the staff put on the shirt and the jacket, and the hole in the shirt is ever so slightly below the hole in the jacket, just as you would expect if it had been fired from a downward angle. Here's, of course, the autopsy diagram by J. Thornton Boswell where you can see that mark on the back below the collar, just to the right of the spinal column, on the left and again on the right, where the right version has been authenticated by Admiral George Berkeley, who is JFK's personal physician. So you can't claim there were holes in the shirt and the jacket, but, that, but not in the body, because the holes in the shirt and the jacket correspond to the hole in the body. 
Here we have Siebert's diagram showing the wound to the back was below any damage to the throat. And, of course, what, what they were seeing at, at the Bethesda of the throat looks as though it was a considerable enlargement of what we had from Charles Crenshaw, to which we shall turn momentarily. And here we have, you know, Berkeley's own uh, death certificate stating that JFK had been killed by a shot to the head and that a second wound occurred at the posterior back at about the level of the third thoracic vertebrae, where it turns out that the third thoracic vertebrae is in the same place. As I've explained, those who want to claim JFK's jacket was bunched up so that the shots in the shirt and the jacket didn't show where they actually were on the body are thereby refuted. And here, of course, we had the stand-in for JFK when the Warren Commission staff did its reconstruction, ironically using the, the Secret Service Cadillac rather than the Lincoln limousine, which... Uh, vitiated its forensic significance. But notice, even the Warren Commission staff was convinced that JFK had been hit in the back. That's that large patch. And then, of course, in the back of the head by the much smaller patch. Now, if we turn, so we've established he was hit in the back, that number one. Here we have the diagrams from Charles Crenshaw, which I published in Assassination Science in 1998, showing the original wound which was a small, clean puncture wound, obviously a wound of entry, versus on the right, after Malcolm Perry, MD, had performed a simple straight line tracheostomy incision uh, through, right through the hole in the, the throat. But where we encounter this in autopsy diagrams, where it's been greatly enlarged, and where Bob Livingston, MD, who is a scientific director of the National Institutes for Mental Health and of Neurological Diseases and Blindness, where the building of the National Institute for Health was across the street from Bethesda Naval Hospital, where he had called Commander Humes, who was in charge of the autopsy earlier in the day, to explain that he'd heard the description of the throat wound. And, and since it was, uh, he was an expert on wound ballistics, having supervised in an emergency medical hospital during the Battle of Okinawa for Japanese prisoners of war and injured Okinawans, he knew that was clearly an entry wound. And thus he told Humes it was particularly important he should dissect the neck very carefully, because if there were any evidence of shots from behind, then they would know there had been at least two shooters and therefore a conspiracy. Instead, what happened was Humes called Livingston later to ask what the throat wound would look at if it had been an accident, and Humes gave him a dis uh, Livingston gave him a description, which Humes appears to have used to alter the wound to make it look more like it was a wound of exit. This is and, all and a, and a bad and a bad wound of exit because if you look at uh, a bolt's uh, wounds of exit, Jim, they are usually uniform in in their exit pattern. They're not in the uh, uh, horizontal, jagged uh, uh, pattern that we see in this image that you that you see here. Also, I, I very brief, briefly wanted to also uh, add that uh, regarding the uh, the uh, back, sh the shot in the back, uh, Marty uh, shots in his book uh, History Will Not Absolve Us. Uh, one of his main uh, it's a book that uh, where he compiles. Uh, letters to Vincent Salandria and, and just uh, throwing out uh, basic uh, uh, information that uh, that totally contradicts the Alona theory and and he uh, one of his uh, main uh, arguments here was the the exact what you were just mentioning about the uh, the back wound and and the uh, shot the way it is aligned in the shirt and the jacket and how it was impossible to that shot to have come out of the throat uh, just by looking at the line. Uh, coming from the, the Texas School Book Depository, had it come from the sixth uh, floor, uh, the southeast uh, corner of the sixth floor uh, of the Texas School Book Depository, and 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 that's uh, you know just basically uh, what uh, Marty Schatz is. is. He's a psychiatrist who wrote a book. Uh, like I said, history will not absolve us. And yes, and it, yes, yes, and and that's one of the main uh, arguments that he uh, puts forth in that book. Yeah, I met Marty and Vincent Boston. We had a very pleasant afternoon conversation. But it's very clear here that, you know, Humes uh, had never dealt with a gunshot victim before, nor had J. Thornton Boswell. So that 
they they didn't do it well because they didn't know what they were doing, Larry. They were using the information Bob Livingston had provided to Humes to alter, but they did it in a messy, very amateurish way. So we got this ridiculous result. And, and in previous programs, we have determined that it was most probably John Liggett who did this hatchet job there at, th- at, uh, at his throat. Well, I've always thought it was Liggett who reconstructed the ear. I've never been persuaded that he was involved in the throat, but he may have been. You believe that Liggett actually messed with the throat? You would think Liggett, who was so skilled with a scalpel, would have done a better job than this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he was supposed to be the best. And, of course, about the blood at the back of the head, David Mantic established using his optical densitometry studies already and. uh at November, December of 1992, that the uh, lateral cranial X-ray, uh, the X-ray of JFK's skull taken from the right side, which you see on the left, had been altered by area P, a patch involving material that was much too dense to be human bone, or by exposure to a bright light to create the same effect, where we know this was a blowout from a bullet that entered right front. Here we can actually see the blood in frame 374, which the perps and their, at, at Hawkeye work, uh, the C, secret CIA lab adjacent to Godak headquarters in Rochester, New York, overlooked, that you can actually see the blowout, where the pinkish part, of course, is the skull flap that's blown open. And then the grayish matter, we've all heard the reference to gray matter, is the exposure where there's some part of the scalp hanging down, but it's a very close proximity. And where we know, of course, when you compare earlier frames, that they blacked out the blowout at the back of the head and frames on the left. And here on the right, of course, you're looking at frame 374, where David also discovered this trail of particles indicative of the second shot uh, to the head that was with a frangible or exploding bullet. Uh, so that we had the entry at the right uh, right temple that actually set up shock waves that blew the brains out the back of the already weakened skull because the Bethesda pathologists have noticed there was an entry wound in the vicinity of the external occipital protuberance, which David has confirmed, but where the HSCA astoundingly would move it upward four inches to the top and completely conceal the blood at the back of the head. And here we got uh, Thomas Evan Robinson, the mortician who spent more time with the body than anyone else, confirming several of these wounds. The large gaping hole in the back of the head, uh, the small wound in the right temple. He spot, talks about the skull uh, flap, uh, three inches, approximately two small shrapnel wounds in the face packed with wax, which David brilliantly inferred were caused by shards of glass when the bullet that hit him in the throat passed through the windshield. Here's confirmation of the wound in the back five to six inches below the shoulder to the right of the backbone that adrenaline glands and brain were removed, other organs removed and put back, but no swelling or discoloration to the face, meaning that he died instantly. It, it, so, so we really don't have a lot of room for argument about JFK having been hit four times in the back from behind and the throat from in front and the right temple from in front. And then what everyone confirms, uh, you know, that that the Bethesda physicians actually had right that he was hit in the back of the head, which David Manick has confirmed. So those are the four hits I've described where David believes there may be evidence of yet a fifth shot to JFK. But where anyone who wants to understand needs to realize that JFK was hit at least four different times. Then there were at least three rounds that missed, one that missed and hit a distant curbing and injured James Tag, another that missed and wound up in the grass where it was picked up by a lieutenant, a third that missed, fired from behind, that hit the chrome strip over the... So that's four plus three is seven, then Connolly one to three times, eight, nine, ten, and if there was yet another shot to the head, that would be 11, and if there was yet another miss, fired from the top of the county records building, 12, that would be my take on the max. Then we find, uh, you know, with this uh, part two, he goes on and on with uh, with uh, his attacks. And Larry, here, I think we're talking about, uh, you know, some photographic evidence you'd like to discuss. Yeah, uh, this is uh, this is the Alton's uh, 
letter. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm uh, I I did not see this uh, image uh, before. Hey, Doctor Fetzer. Um, didn't wasn't the sign hit several times as well? Well, yes, the sign does seem to have been hit. In addition, uh, Gary, so you make a point that there could be, therefore, even a larger number than 12. 12 sounds like a large number, but it may actually have been 14. 14, 15? The sign was hit more than once, even 14. Mm-hmm. This is talking about the shirt. I could, I should probably, uh, the, let's see, the shirt worn the day of the assassination. I think we must be talking about Billy here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is sort of like, uh, uh, off topic here. <laughs> yeah, I think I may have this in the wrong order, Larry. We can, we can move forward to, to, uh, uh, you know, here you're identifying many different areas in which the Alchin's yeah. six has been altered. And yeah. because there's so much here, I broke it into two parts so you could talk about each of the parts separately. Yes, of course. Uh, this is the uh, the Saturday Evening Post version of the Alchin 6 photograph, which was published on December 14, 1963. This, is, this was the very first time that, and I would have to say, uh, quote, unquote, the entire photograph was published. Because uh, the uh, the night of the assassination and the and, the, and Saturday after the 23rd, uh, only extremely cropped versions of the photograph were published. Now, the very first time that uh, the entire and 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 again, this is a hypothetical, you know, because I believe this photograph extended more upwards as uh, as a photograph uh, would have, you know, of this type of uh, quality and uh, and the. Uh, Show more of the facade of the book. Yeah, would have shown more of the, yeah, based on the and quality. The tree, and the tree, maybe they wanted to obfuscate the tree because it provided an obstacle in between the sixth floor alleged shooting lair and the target. I agree. I agree. And uh, I believe somebody in the OIC had stated that, uh, uh, one of the, our new members stated that, uh, the uh, photograph should have shown, like you say, most, uh, a lot more. And the upper portions of the photograph, the uh, upper portions of the Texas School Book Depository building, and uh, because if you look at the photograph, uh, it, it looks like more uh, horizontal. In, in fact, you know this type of photo photograph would have been uh, more square. And and uh, basically, uh, in this quadrant of the photograph that we're looking at here, uh, towards the left, uh, you see areas that are, were never published before. And I'm talking about the. Uh, Two, two circles. Uh, there's a uh, oval to the left and a circle, which you, we see obvious uh, ink blotches. Okay, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. And I, I believe we have we have already uh, spent some time talking about. Uh, the well, I wanted to I wanted to go back to this, Larry, because D. Eugenio and others seem to think there was no opportunity to alter the Alchin Six, and yet it's been massively altered. <laughs> different ways i mean uh, yeah these are very obvious jim i know exactly if you look at emery roberts you know you look at the uh the windshield you know the way you know the tint is totally uh amorphous you know it is not uh the regular line that you see in a tint uh tinted glass you know in, the, in a windshield and then we're not even going to talk about the uh the doorway but excluding that area you know when you look at uh, emery roberts here and the two splotches on the left you know it's pretty obvious you know that uh uh, this photograph has been altered, and then if you look at the other, the next slide, which shows the right portion of the photograph, uh, uh, quickly here, yeah. Uh, for example, uh, Dennis Camino has identified. If you look in the uh, the white vehicle behind LBJ's car, which was a Secret Service detail, the door has been open. Uh, they have, they are already reacting, but if you look. Inside, if you try to look inside the the, uh, the vehicle, uh, the faces of those of the occupants of the vehicle have been also obscured. I mean, why would that happen? Why why would that be the case? And then you have also uh, other areas. For example, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, um, stairway. You know, the uh, the fire escape there. You know, on the Dialtex building, uh, uh, where there's an area there where the uh, the, the, the window, 
that we know of. And then above that, you know, there, and you cannot see it uh, here in, in this uh, version because there's another version that shows uh, higher up there was a black man there on the on the stairway, and there is an area that, that obscures part of his legs there. And then uh, more, if you go f further down, you know, at LBJ's car where Rufus Youngblood was sitting, you can see that uh, parts of his, of his face have been obscured. Uh, the uh, right fender of the vehicle, there's a black splotch there. And and then a, 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 a spectator there, right there in the middle, and this was also done by Dennis Camino, uh, at the top left, uh, has been obscured there as well. So if, if just by looking at these basic uh, shapes that, that we see in the Algen 6 photograph, um, how can you see it, say that it has, it has not been altered when these are very obvious cases of alteration? I think he's just displaying his utter incompetence and he knows nothing about photography or alteration and really has never studied, studied the subject. Look at how many times he was coming after me about Sandy Hook, the Boston bombing, the Holocaust, what have you, where he knew nothing whatsoever about the subject. I mean, to me, it's it's just the height of arrogance to be attacking somebody for research you you have never read and do not understand. Well, yeah, that, yeah. Go ahead, Jagger. Go ahead, Gary. Now, I was just saying that I just can't believe that Eugenio gave up his credibility over the Boston Marathon and Sandy Hook. I mean, those have been researched beyond a shadow of a doubt. So, I don't like you said. I don't think he'll ever recover from this myself. Well, this this slide shows a close-up of the left side of the Saturday Evening Post version of the Alton Six, and uh, we have outlined the uh, obvious, so very obvious areas of obfuscation and uh, and ink splotches that have been uh, placed here on the uh, on the extant uh, version of the photograph. And if you look at the woman there, uh, where the the red arrow, it uh, seems that she has a camera. At, uh, at face level, okay, yeah. and for some reason uh, that camera has been obscured, and you can ob you can see very clearly that she there's a hand strap, okay, and when we look at those same women from the other side, from the Zapruder's point of view, and this is uh, looking at uh, the Zapruder frame, that's I'm sorry, the Zapruder film, and and these splotches obviously are, are not there. These are the, exactly the same women, but take the, but uh, looked at from the opposite way, from uh, like I said, from which uh, Zapruder Zapruder's uh, uh, point of view would have been. Now, now these these women obviously. Uh, I think both of them had cameras, okay? And uh, the woman uh, has, has been identified as Maggie Brown from the Dallas uh, Morning News. She and her and her uh, co-workers, okay, Aurelia Alonso and uh, and uh, a couple of the other women, uh, they they went down there and they were there at the uh, north curb of the uh, of, uh, of Elm Street. And and what really intrigues me is the one on the right, Jim, because uh, this one has really been obscured. I mean, the ink, ink, ink splotch is a lot bigger, okay? And it seems to me that the only reason that uh, they would have done anything like this is because it uh, they were filming the, the assassination or taking pictures. Now, the, the and, direction... And, 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 Larry, just to be more precise... She would have captured Lyndon ducking down in his vehicle. Exactly. That's what I was just going to mention. Her the yeah. line of sight of, of her position there, you know, she's not, she is not, she does not have her camera train on JFK. She has her camera train on LBJ and his car. When you look at the, uh, the entire photograph, uh, you know, uh, in, in a more, in, in, in the complete version of the photograph, you can see that it's very clear that uh, her line of sight and, you know, what she would, would have been filming would have been LBJ. And that obviously would have contained, uh, you know, what LBJ was doing at the time of the assassination. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Here's the next. This is a close-up of the Secret Service of uh... Emery Roberts. Yeah. The man in this charge. Is the same, this is the same Emery Roberts who called off Henry Ripka at Love Field, okay? And, and the other agent, right, left the That's two right. behind. And then when John Reddy started to respond and Dealey Blase, he called him back. That's right. And uh, so this is the same Emery Roberts who uh, later on uh, – uh, 
some people think that he later on uh, committed suicide. You know, apparently he had uh, uh, it was very remorseful for what he did or what he did not do. Uh, well, it was um, a very nasty piece of work. He was an absolutely crucial player to bringing about the assassination in terms of its actual execution in Dealey Plaza. I agree. I agree. And anybody who looks at this blow up here, Jim, and does not come out, come out with the idea that this man, that this uh, image here has been obfuscated. You know, I don't know what the heck that they're thinking and what they're looking at because. Well, Larry, you got some people who look at the doorway area and you got a man whose face has been scraped off and they say there's no alteration. You got a man who's missing his left shoulder. You got a man who's in front of him and behind him at the same time. You got a man whose face has been blacked out and they claim they can't see any evidence of alteration. I mean, what, what are we dealing with? What is the level of intelligence here? Yeah, yeah. And again, this was originally uh, circulated by, again, uh, Dem Dennis Camino, you know, who's uh, extremely Dennis perceptive. Is, yeah, Dennis is completely brilliant at this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so now, I, I know you want to talk about the Auction 7, Larry, so go for it. Yeah, yeah. Auction 7, uh, I just wanted to first mention that Jack White uh, uh, was very public about all four uh, images, uh, photographs uh, by Ike Alchins being altered in one way or another, four, five, six, and seven. And this is, uh, the first image here is what is supposed to be the contact print, okay, of the, uh, of his... Uh, You're talking about the top left. Yeah, yeah, the first uh, two, three, four, five, six, and seven at the bottom. Okay, now, now, uh, usually contact prints are uniform, you know, they, they are, they are, they one, they're one after another. And this one, as, as you can see, they've been cut up, you know, and they've been reassembled. Right, they, they, right. they've been segmented. Exactly. This is not a continuous roll as you'd have in an ordinary contact sheet. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, uh, number seven at the bottom, if you look at the top right, this is the uncropped version of well, what is the extant, which uh, extant means surviving a version of the uh, Auction 7, if you look at the top right, you can see that it's very obvious that the cement railing has been chopped off at the yes. top. Yes. Okay. Now, why would that be? Okay. Now, uh, you know, once we start getting into that, then, you know, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of situations here that we can uh, come up with. Now, the, the uh, Number eight, I just wanted to go uh, a little bit, uh, uh, the time difference between number eight on the right, uh, which would be the... Uh, second row on the right. Uh, that's right, second row on the right, okay? And number seven and number six, there seems to have been a lot of time difference in, in, the, in the time frame is when Alton snapped these pictures. As Alton's being a professional photographer, you know, he would have been trained to snap pictures off continuously. Right, right, right. Quick, okay. quick, 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 quick. Exactly, exactly. If a historic event like this, or you don't want to miss anything. Exactly. So right away, I'm looking at, uh, and we're going to make some comparisons now with this Bruder film, you know, as far as, you know, uh, photographs that he should have, it seems like he would have been taking, but snapping, but, uh, you know, they don't seem to be in, in the record at all. So uh, if we go on to the next slide here, we can... Uh, Zip right through this. Yeah, here. Uh, it, it, this is a Pruder frame. Uh, what is this? Uh, 349 or something like that? Uh, anyway, uh, you can see that uh, Alton seems to be taking a picture here uh, at, uh, at the time where Clint Hill is, is uh, starting to uh, get into the uh, JFK limo. Okay, and to the right, we see Malcolm Summers. Who, who, that, that, that's Alton's above Jackie. That's right. Alton's is right about above Jackie, and to the left of him is uh, Jim Botham. Both of them were professional photographers, okay? And right there at the bottom, right of uh, right of Alton's, left of him, you know, if, if we would have been facing us, uh, is uh, Malcolm Summers, which we uh, spoke about then uh, when we did the Blink Rate uh, program. Remember, we did that uh, short uh, uh, where we determined that he had... Uh, he dove to the right and reincorporated himself in, into a squat in ele only 11 frames, which would have been impossible based on Roy Schaefer's uh, research. Okay, but coming back to here, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, Alchins 
what it seems to be snapping a photograph. If we go on to the next uh, slide, I think we can uh, get a better uh, perspective. Yeah, right here. Okay, where he seems to be uh, snapping a photograph right there, which would have shown the uh, grassy knoll. Okay, and this isn't even. We're not even starting to see him snapping Alton Seven because Alton Seven he sh he shot from behind the right. limb. Right. Okay. So, so uh, what I'm trying to uh, establish here is that the Alchins probably shot maybe one, even two additional photographs. Yes. Which, yes, which were probably at a time would have provided enough opportunity. Yes. Yes. Based on you know the background and everything that uh, we have established here, and and again, if you look at Malcolm Summers, and we uh, dealt with this uh, in not uh, to mention Langford. Larry that the limo stop would have given him so many opportunities. That's you right. See, this yeah, is extremely true. suspicious. He that's might have right. taken a whole sequence about the stop and and and, and Bobby Hargis dismounting and running between the limo and the secret right. agent surrounding the president and taking the piece of skull from the little boy, throwing it in the back, and Officer Douglas motoring up the side of the grassy knoll. Right. Until That's his right. bike fell over. How could you miss that? That's right. That's right. So there is a reason for this, you know, and that's why when we look at uh, the frames that are missing, especially when you look at the uh, reaction of Malcolm Summers, you know, which we uh, dealt with, uh, like I said, in the Blink Rate uh, show that we did uh, a few weeks ago, uh, then it, it, then it, it really... Uh, becomes clear why they would have uh, removed these frames because they would have shown uh, Ike Alchins taking additional photographs. There's one of the yellow stripes freshly painted on the yeah yeah, yeah the exactly. concrete to define the kill zone. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So this then uh, this is an uh, uh, a an enlargement here of Alchin Seven, and as we mentioned before. The uh, top right uh, of the photograph, where it has been chopped off, which would have shown the uh, the cement railing, and you have been up there. We've been up there many times, you know, and you know that uh, you know. I, I don't know what, what what reason there would have been to uh, remove that portion of the photograph, but uh, who was there, you know, and who, uh, you know, what were they trying to uh, remove there and, and, and obfuscate? Uh, you know, Larry, I've long believed this this could even be a completely fabricated photograph. What's your take about it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, another thing that I wanted to mention briefly here is uh, based on the Newcomb tapes, uh, Harry Freeman stated clearly that he was in between the lead car and the JFK limo, okay? Now, you look at this photograph, and he's nowhere to be seen here, okay? And he was very specific about his position being uh, right in front of the JFK limo off of the front bumper and right behind the lead car. And we're going to go a little bit into uh, the, the, the what's really going on in, 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 in the lead car in a couple of frames here, a couple of slides here. But uh, that, that's, uh, that's very interesting what you just pointed out because uh, Gary Freeman, I mean, I'm sorry, Harry Freeman, uh, stated uh, that uh, his position was right in between those two cars, and he's not visible here at all. Yeah, I have to really look at this picture in a suspicious way because they're about to hit the curb. And that would have probably thrown Jackie and Clint Hill right off the back of the car. You can see they're about to hit the curb really hard. Well, it seems like they're right in the middle of the, uh, of the road here. It's, very, it's, it's a very strange photograph. Yeah. yeah, they're about to hit the curb, though you can tell. Now, now this is a, a composite that I did of a photograph that shows the uh, upper right-hand por portion of the Alton Seven, uh, comparing it to another photo taken that day that shows what has been chopped off of the Alton uh, Seven photograph. Okay, so it's pretty obvious that uh, you know there was something going on there in that area that they did not want. Uh, to be uh, preserved, you know, uh, for the for the record, there, Jim. Now uh, we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit, a little bit about the flag, the uh, JFK, the uh, the the presidential flag that was flying on the on the limousine. Okay, if you look at the uh, fringe, and this is important because uh, what, what we're going to talk about uh, now in the next couple of slides is very. Uh, um, relevant to this. Uh, these flags had a, a fringe, a decorative 
fringe which uh, bordered the the flag itself okay and uh, the next slide please uh, we're just gonna look at uh, the the five the three different uh, Alton's uh, photographs show the flag uh, Alton's five shows the right side of the flag Alton six shows the left side of the flag and they both have the presidential seal okay and and the uh, circle uh, around the of the seal okay now the Alton seven doesn't show anything okay it seems like it's been uh, blacked out in some way. All right, uh, so yeah. I, I believe this is very, very significant uh, for what we're going to talk about next here. Go on to the next. Now, this is a blow-up of the lead car, all right? And uh, it shows, uh, first of all, very obvious that both of the uh, brake lights are on, okay, which would have meant that uh, Chief Curry, Jesse Curry, was had had this car either stopped or very close to being stopped. Well, if you think about it, Larry, since a presidential limousine was brought to a halt, they didn't want to miss anything. They would have stopped too to watch. Exactly. Now, now the presidential flag, like I said, is has very a very strange anomaly coming out of it. Okay, and it's like a, a squiggly uh, figure that uh, goes up and divides the rear window. Okay, of the uh, lead car. All right, and uh, this would have allowed for masking and opaquing of that area, because if you look at the left of the uh, window, you'll see that the, the, there is a figure turned around completely, and he seems to be completely turned around and looking at uh, what's going on behind him. I, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious to me. Yeah, watching the whole thing. I think yeah. the whole back window has been obfuscated so you can't see more clearly that there were as many as three looking back at what was going on. Exactly. So this man, we know that this man is uh, uh, Sheriff Decker, Bill Decker, okay, and uh, and he was the one seated in, in that position in the car. Next to him was uh, uh, Secret Service uh, Sorrells, and then and in the front seat next to uh, Curry, was uh, Secret Service man uh, Lawson, okay? Now, uh, what, uh, what really has befuddled me here is that squiggly, like wh like white squiggly yeah. line, which is emanating from the flag, okay? Right. Now, this is not part of the fringe of the flag. It's pretty obvious, you know? And nobody, I don't know of anybody who's ever, you know, questioned this, you know? And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious, you know, in the Alton 7, okay? Now, uh, later on in that same weekend, uh, the Alton 7, when it was published, uh, it, it was uh, it was published without the left side of the vehicle, okay? So it did not show uh, Bill Decker or the left uh, brake light, the left rear light, showing the uh, that the limo, I mean, that the uh, lead car had stopped. Okay, and I, I believe uh, we have an image of that coming up coming up later on. But uh, the next one is going to show us a little bit more uh, detail of what I'm talking about. Okay, now we cannot see uh, Decker. We can see Decker, but we cannot see Sorrells, Lawson, or Curry. And I have outlined here in in uh, T uh, color uh, the the uh, white uh, area that is seems to be dividing the rear windshield here. The, the rear uh, window here. And, and of course, uh, the brake lights are on. Brake lights are on, exactly. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, here, this is a, a, the same photograph. And, I mean, this is a classic because this comes from the New York Times, Jim. And, it, it, you know, why? <laughs> this one makes me laugh because the one you can obviously see, you know, that they have cut out what they want, do not want you to see. All right. Uh, you cannot see uh, Sheriff Decker. You cannot see the left uh, light, okay, tail light, you know, of the lead car, okay. Uh, you cannot see the upper portion, which uh, was cut out, okay, the railing, the cement railing at the top, okay. And even you, I believe, uh, you have done some re some research on this, where uh, the position of of uh, Clint uh, Hill and Jackie are not even consistent with the uh, Zapruder film. Yeah, it's very, very curious. And this is a relatively high-definition photograph, as you can see. I mean, this is from a newspaper printing. Look at all the pixels. 
Yeah, I, I, I scanned this from my own personal copy of the New York Times of uh, November 23rd, 1963, which is when it was published. Okay, so in such a visible uh, newspaper uh, uh, you know, publication, you know, this is what we uh, have, you know, presented to the American public. You know, I mean, I think it's pathetic. <laughs> the Alton 7 in all of its splendor. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that, that I'm not able to get the slides to advance the way. Okay, here we go. This very interesting case of Lucien Conin having been caught in a famous photograph, which they try to suggest was actually Robert Adams. This is, this is amazing, Larry. Right above JFK's head is one yeah. of the, the face of one of the most famous assassins in the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Stanley Carno uh, published a book about Vietnam, and uh, he uh, published uh, a, a photograph of Lucent Conine there, and uh, it's a dead ringer for this man right here. And I and I did uh, some overlays for you uh, that I believe we're going to see in a couple of minutes here that uh, sort of established that it, it might have been uh, one of the same man. You know, here's a close up. Yeah, yeah, this is the Alton's four. And here is the claim, this man on the left, this uh, Adams, is supposed to be who is actually seen in the photograph, and Lucien Conin here by comparison. But the Adams thing, it just, it, it turns out to be so implausible. They were truly grasping after straws, Larry. Yeah, and, and I believe uh, uh, Jack White uh, did a study on this uh on this comparison, and uh, he was adamant that it was uh, Lucian Conine, you know, that it was not. Oh, yeah, well, Adams. here, the, the, the Adams claimed to have received a plaque for appearing in a photograph in Dealey Plaza, which is absurd. And when they talk about it, they even have the date wrong, Thursday, November 23rd, when, of course, the shooting was on Friday. It was on Friday, and it was the 22nd, so they get it wrong both ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's about as absurd as it gets. And here was a study Jack did of of, of Adams on the left and Conine right. on the center and Conine on the right. And notice the features that identify him as square face, short chin, left ear, top out, square face, short chin, left ear, top out, versus Adams, long face, long chin, left ear, top in. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. pretty telling stuff. And yeah, then the, the, again, the photograph, uh, the photograph is from Stanley Carnell's, uh, Stanley Carnell's book. Yeah, this is the overlay that we did here. So Adams doesn't look like a very good fit, does he? <laughs> Codeine fits. You, you've done such wonderful stuff, Larry, including, of course, with Doorman. It's absolutely sensational. Well, I thought that the once uh, again, it, it all, all boils down to interpupillary distance. When you get those down, you know everything else just falls into place. If it's the, if it is the man that uh, corresponds to that image, then it's going to bear out. If not, it's going to be. It's not going to work. You know, so you know it's pretty obvious. Gary, you want to add some thoughts here? Now it's just devastating how this overlay stuff is just um, rewriting the books, isn't it? It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. This may be the last of, of the slide set. Yeah, are there any you'd like me to go back to? No, no, I think uh, oh, we still got eight more minutes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think uh, some of the uh, the new uh, people that we're getting on in the OIC apparently are being swayed, you know, by, you know, all this uh, new technology and all this research uh, where, for example, this uh, Richard Shattuck uh, originally had uh, had uh, stated that he thought it was Billy Lovelady uh, as doorman, yeah. and, and now he has, you know, come 180 degrees, you know, and, and uh, stated that he agrees that it's Lee Oswald. You know, Larry, I think that Jim DiEugenio did us a huge favor by writing this elaborate attack upon me because it afforded an opportunity to go through the research and lay it out in great detail, enough, I think, to convince anyone about any of the diverse subjects that were addressed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, when, when you uh, make uh, those type of statements, you know, in that type of an article, you know, you better – 
you know, uh, be able to uh, dot, all, dot all the I's and cross all the T's, Jim. Now, I, I thought it was a very elementary uh, work. or uh, it, it looks like to me that he had already written quite a few articles about Peter Janney, Phil Nelson, um, and Dr. Fetzer, and he seems like he put them all together. Uh, it seemed almost like a rushed article. It was um, just so wide open, and I don't see how anyone who's taken any of the time to go through in, uh, what Dr. Fetzer's laid out. And like you were saying, it's very easy to make a, an accusation that you're wrong, and it's very difficult to come back and prove that the person's wrong. Well, Gary, I, I think in hour. fact, I think in fact, a great deal of time and effort was devoted to this, and that he consulted a whole lot of my critics to get their input. Uh, you know, Tink Thompson, Robert Broden, maybe even Judy Wood. I mean, I got an email from a, a supporter of Judy Wood telling me. That I, I, uh, I, I had a surprise coming and I wasn't gonna like it. And it was quite a while before I put two and two together and realized they were talking about Jim DiEugenio's two, two part attack. Well, well, I, I just thought that, uh, for example, this passage that I, uh, that I drew from, uh, from his article was a little bit uh, ambiguous and, and, and a little bit uh, distorted here because he, he stated that he had come to have his doubts about photo identification as a reliable method to solve a crime, yet uh, he, uh, he relies on Robert Grodin and his work uh, as gospel, you know, to, to uh, assert, you know, a lot of the, uh, the issues, you know, that... Uh, you know, for example, the man in the doorway and, and that kind of thing, uh, specifically uh, the, the the shirt, okay, which we all know doesn't even fit, uh, you know, based on uh, Judy Baker's uh, pixelation uh, studies. And, and that's not even uh, talking about, not even... Uh, Talking about the the overlays that we have done, and and when you when you sort of uh, state uh, this kind of thing about uh, you know not uh, really wanting to rely about the, with uh, photographic uh, interpretation, then uh, you know it's, it's sort of like uh, what are you going to do? Dismiss all the photographic evidence? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah. key is to sort out which is authentic and which is not. Gary, would you like to talk about his methodology and going through each of the speakers who spoke at the? At the Santa Barbara conference, you were the first, I think, to put your finger on it. Yeah, if you do go through the article, it's every person from the very first speaker all the way to the very last. Larry Rivera and um, yep. actually well, Don yeah. Fox come into the mix. The first speaker in Santa Barbara was Phil Nelson. Mm -hmm. Phil then, Nelson, then we had John Hankey. Hankey. He criticized Hankey for a long time. Then, then we had then Larry Peter, Rivera. Then, then Peter um, Janney. Yeah, Peter Janney was next, and, and then, then Ralph Sinkay, and then you. No, you left out Ra Ralph Sinkay. No, I said Ralph Sinkay. Well, we were talking over one another, but the point is, mm -hmm. it does look as though that was the template, don't you think, Larry, that he was going to try to, you know, just take out the everything that had happened at the Santa Barbara conference as a demonstration of his superior knowledge over even all of the speakers at the symposium I organized for the 50th observance. That's right, and we had some really good information that was presented there, and uh, and especially uh, Richard Hook's uh, uh, collages there that were really spectacular, uh, you know, something that had never been done, and uh, I thought uh, I thought that was one of the one of the very uh, highlights of the of the conference there. Yeah, you made an impression. You made an impression on me, Doctor Fetcher. You said this years ago that the Santa Barbara Conference was the only conference that would have an enduring significance, and um, that's really come to pass because this entire article is about that particular conference. And it's such an utter and abject failure. I mean, no one ob on objective grounds could support any of the conclusions or criticisms he draws and directs at me. It's really quite ridiculous. Anyone, by the way, who'd like to check it out can find it online, JFK at 50, The Assassination of America. It's on my blog, for example, at jamesfetzer.blogspot.com. 
where you can see all of those speakers, their backgrounds and their presentations together in one place, very direct, very accessible. Having gone through all of this, that might be something you want to do. Gary, you want to take us out? All right, Dr. Fetzer, um, I admire you for putting in that much time uh, rebutting this ridiculous article. Larry Rivera, kicking rear in as usual with some great new research. We're going to have Don Fox on next week. So um, I just I just feel the place to go in JFK research is right here. And um, I don't understand how Lynn Ostanek puts up with it over there. But I guess that's the way it is. So we'll see you next week. We've got Dr. James Fetzer, Larry Rivera, Don Fox, myself, and Chance George. We'll see you next week for JFK 98. Hi, my name's Gary King, and I've assembled the most formidable JFK team on planet Earth. We've got Dr. James Fetzer, Larry Rivera, who is the number one researcher in the world today when it comes to new research. And we've got Don Fox, who's not afraid to look a little bit deeper than anyone else. So if you're interested in what happened to the 35th president of the United States, then I invite you to our show. It's called The New JFK Show. And it's on YouTube. Go to Gary King YouTube channel. And we've got over 90 shows archived for you there. So if you really want to know the truth, and knowing that over 9 out of 10 researchers are working the other side of the street in a sea of disinformation, I pledge to you the truth about JFK. Go to Gary King YouTube channel and find out your true history.